Good morning. And welcome to worship this morning. A special welcome to those of you who are worshiping online. Today is the 20, what is it, 25 or 26? Uh, 26 Sunday uh, after Pentecost. Moving to next Sunday, which is Christ the King Sunday, which is the last Sunday of the church year. And that means Advent is soon upon us. But let's talk about today. Uh, we welcome, we don't really welcome, Kirthana is a part of our congregation, but Kirthana Babu, our, our field ed student from Princeton Seminary, is the preacher today. She has a great sermon, and as she is preaching, think about our stewardship uh, theme, marked with the cross of Christ. Kirthana does a great job of saying how she is marked with this cross. And uh, just something to, for us to think about throughout the service. Go back to the baptismal font, make the sign of the cross upon your forehead as we wear our faith, as we show up in the world marked with the cross of Christ. So let us begin with our confession and forgiveness. I would invite the congregation to please rise. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, our refuge, our delight, our beginning and our end. Amen. Amen. Let us come in truth before the one who loves us and has freed us from our sin. Eternal One, robed in majesty and mercy, we confess that sin has taken hold of us and we are complicit in its power. We are disturbed in spirit and our hearts cannot rest. Unbind us and set us free. Lead us again to the waters of rebirth that we may live just and generous lives for the good of your world and the care of our neighbors, following in the servant way of Jesus. Amen. These words are trustworthy and true. Christ bore our sins once for all on the cross swallowing up death forever. For his sake, you are forgiven, and God remembers your sin no more. Let your heart be glad again and rejoice in your salvation. Amen.
saints before us may see you face to face. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace, in peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the reign of God and for peace throughout the world, for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For your people here who have come to give you praise, for the strength to live your word, let us pray to the Lord. and defend us, O God. Amen. Almighty God, your sovereign purpose brings salvation to birth. Give us faith to be steadfast amid the tumults of this world, trusting that your kingdom comes and your will is done through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. I will remember their sins. 
Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. <laughs> word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. We will now read Psalm 16 responsibly. Protect me, O God, for I take refuge in you. I have said to the Lord, You are my Lord, my God above all other. All my delight is in the godly that are in the land, upon those who are noble among the people. <coughs> those who run after other gods shall have their troubles multiplied. I will not pour out drink offerings to such gods. Never take their names upon my lips. O Lord, you are my portion and my cup. It is you who uphold my lot. My boundaries enclose a pleasant land. Indeed, I have a rich inheritance. I will bless the Lord who gives me counsel. My heart teaches me night after night. I have set the Lord always before me. Because God is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. My heart, therefore, is glad, and my spirit rejoices. My body also shall rest in hope. For you will not abandon me to the grave, nor let your Holy One see the pit. You will show me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy, and in your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Gospel according to Mark, the 13th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. As Jesus came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what large stones and what large buildings. Then Jesus asked him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. When he was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will this be, and what will be the sign that all these things are about to be accomplished? Then Jesus began to say to them, Beware that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am he and they will lead many astray. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is still to come. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. This is but the beginning of the birth pain. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Last week in our Gospel reading, Pastor Peter talked about how the temple scribes devoured the widows' houses and exploited the poor. The temple was a great yet corrupt institution. Immediately after Jesus' story about the widow giving her last coin to the temple, 
Strangely, a disciple remarks to Jesus about how grand the stones of the temple are. Perhaps the disciple is idolizing the temple, a human-built, flawed institution, which, like all idols, is temporary. Jesus responds that not one stone will be left. The great temple, which seems so stable, so permanent, and so powerful, will fall. Jesus continues with the apocalyptic imagery, warning about false prophets and earthquakes and famines and wars. This immense chaos sounds like the end of the world. But Jesus says, do not be alarmed. All this chaos has to happen, for it is the beginning of the birth pangs. All of this suffering and destruction is not the end of the world. Rather, it is leading to the birth of something new. Last year, I went to a Christmas Eve Mass at a Catholic church. Just a little over two months had passed at that point since the terrorist attack in Gaza on October 7th, which led to increased conflict in Israel and Palestine. This was a very unsettling and devastating time for many. And for many who were directly involved or like, part of this situation, this was the end of their world as they knew it. I remember that the priest's homily was incredibly inspiring. He said that God chose to incarnate into chaos. God chose to incarnate into the suffering and political instability of Roman-occupied Judea. And therefore, God is most of all present with us in the time of chaos. But when it feels like our world is ending, it can sometimes feel like God is absent and our faith can feel shaky. Yes, we know God is always present, but how do we notice God's presence amidst the chaos when our world seems to be ending, how do we persevere in our faith? We can look to our Christian ancestors to gain some insight into how they endured their times of trial. In today's reading from Hebrews, the author says, Let us approach God with a true heart and full assurance of faith. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. Let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, but encouraging one another. Deepening our faith and encouraging each other in our faith, this is how we can persevere amidst the trials of our present world until the day when Jesus comes again. There is one spiritual practice that Christians have used for the past 2,000 years in order to glorify God and encourage one another on their journey of faith. This is testimony. Through testifying to each other about how they have personally experienced the faithfulness of God in their lives or in the lives of their community, Christians have been able to persevere in their faith and endure even the worst times of chaos. But today, sharing your testimony is often associated with a particular church context, often a charismatic or evangelical type of church. Sharing testimonies in church during the service isn't really something Lutherans do. <laughs> but we should. There is so much power in sharing these stories of how God is still at work in our lives. So today, I'm going to share my testimony with all of you. I'm going to tell you how God found me in the midst of my own apocalyptic time when my world seemed like it was ending. I'm going to tell you how Christ gave me a new identity and a new way of life that I had never learned before from the world. And during this difficult time, my faith was the strongest it has ever been. And I had the priceless gift of a Christian community of peers and mentors 
who encouraged me in my faith. And that is how I was able to persevere. As some of you know, I grew up in San Jose, California, in the heart of the Silicon Valley. I went to an incredibly prestigious public high school in an affluent area, mostly made up of wealthy Asian immigrants who were working in white collar professional careers like software engineering or medicine. The academic culture of my high school, I hear, is very similar to the high schools here in West Windsor. Just like the disciple who idolized the temple, my community idolized academic and financial success. For us, heaven wasn't heaven. Heaven was Harvard. Walking into the pearly gates of Harvard Yard, that was our ultimate goal in life. That, for us, was salvation. Your value and worth as a human being was directly tied to how academically successful you were, specifically in science and math, the only subjects that count, apparently, <laughs> and how likely you were to be admitted into a top university and eventually get a well-paying job. And like most others in my community, I fully bought into this mindset. And I worked really, really hard in high school. But it was never enough. Not for my parents, not for my peers, not for myself. I was never seen as worthy or successful since I didn't excel in math or science, which, yeah, the only subjects that lead to success, apparently. <laughs> it didn't matter that I had straight A's in literature and history or French. Those weren't valuable. In my sophomore year of high school, I decided against my teacher's advice to skip all the prerequisite courses and take the most advanced math course offered at my high school, AP Calculus BC. This class, I'm telling you, is more challenging than most first-year college math courses. But I enrolled in it because I thought that doing this would finally make my peers, my parents, and myself see me as someone with value. And when I took this class, my peers were impressed with me and thought I was smart and successful. And if I could succeed in AP Calculus BC as a sophomore in high school, something very few other students had even dared to attempt, I could finally attain salvation. <sighs> I'm sure you can guess how that worked out. <laughs> I failed, big time. I had an F, and I had to drop the course in the middle of the year. And you know, you might think this is not a big deal, this is just a high school math course, but in my context, this was the end of the world. So many of my classmates simply stopped talking to me. They avoided me in the hallways. People who I thought were my friends abandoned me. I was socially ostracized and became invisible. I was treated as a failure who would never amount to anything, both at school and at home. I was never going to get into heaven. I was not getting into Harvard. Honestly, at this time, I did not think life was worth living. Maybe other people could live life and succeed, but for me, there was no point. It would just be suffering and failure. But as I said earlier, God is most present in our times of suffering. On Saturday, December 9th, 2017, I remember I was just sitting in my bed in my room at home. I was alone, my family wasn't home, I don't really remember doing much. I was just sitting there. And then I experienced a miraculous moment, just like Paul on the road to Damascus when he went through this dramatic conversion experience. I had a vision, and I saw Jesus right in front of me with his arms extended out. 
it was more real than anything I have ever experienced before. So I didn't question it, even though I was a fierce atheist. And at that time, I was so stubborn and strong-headed that nobody could convince me that God exists. I thought religion was stupid. Nobody could have convinced me but Jesus himself. And that is what he did. And then I felt that I was being told to go pick up a Bible and start reading. I wasn't even sure that my family had a Bible in our house. My family, they aren't, they're not Christian, they're Hindu. But then I remembered something. <laughs> Once when my family stayed in a hotel in Utah, my grandfather stole the Gideon Bible, <laughs> which was on the nightstand. And I have it here today. <laughs> This is one of my most prized possessions. Through this stolen Bible right here, I learned about God and I became Christian. God can transform anything to opportunities to be glorified, am I right? <laughs> and when I flipped open this Bible, it landed on the book of James, which perhaps is ironic since I'm a Lutheran today. <laughs> And the first chapter of James says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. And it's true, my faith was really tested. My family is Hindu, and due to the colonial history of missionary work in India, they are incredibly anti-Christian. They would have been furious if they found out I became Christian. There is no chance that they would have tolerated that. So I had to hide being Christian for years while I was still under their financial support. This meant that I could not attend church I could not get baptized. I had to take off and hide my illegal cross necklace every day before I came home from school. I had to write in my prayer journal entirely in French in case they found it. <laughs> While I hated having to do that, two good things came out of it. My faith became deepened and I became fluent en français. <laughs> but even though it was an incredibly difficult daily struggle, I was going to continue to carry my cross. I wasn't going to let any of that religious persecution stop me from being deeply in love with God. Through the Bible, I learned that the ways of the world were not the ways of God. That regardless of my academic failures, and regardless of how my peers or my parents had labeled me as a failure, God loved me and God valued me as a child of God. I had a new identity in Christ. I was saved by grace through faith. I didn't have to do anything to get into heaven. Heaven was no longer Harvard. Heaven on earth was knowing Jesus and finding that peace of God that surpasses all understanding. This time of trial was incredibly fruitful in my spiritual development journey. Every single free minute I had, I read my Bible. Everywhere you caught me at school, lunch, my free period, every time I was reading my Bible. I read it cover to cover. I was dying of thirst and had finally been given living water. I also knew it was essential for me to learn more about God and grow in my faith in a Christian community. And since I couldn't go to church, I secretly attended the Christian club meetings and worship sessions at my high school. That group was so supportive and encouraging of me, and it was the one place in my high school where I was valued, regardless of my academic capabilities. 
The other club members showed me what being Christian meant. They prayed with me, they discussed theology with me, and even loaned me spiritual books. At that time, that was my church. I also reached out to my English teacher, Mrs. Clark, who is a devout Christian, and I still consider her one of my spiritual mentors today. She and I have had many deep, meaningful discussions about God and how God is acting in our lives. Even now, every year when I go back home for the holidays, I make it a point to get a meal with Mrs. Clark and just discuss life. I also always attend the Epiphany service with her at her Greek Orthodox Church. When I sensed that God was calling me to ministry, Mrs. Clark was the first person I told, and she affirmed my call. Holding fast to the confession of my hope without wavering, trusting in God's faithfulness, and participating in an authentic Christian community which encouraged me, that is what helped me survive my apocalyptic times. And after high school, I went to a Christian college, St. Olaf in Minnesota, where I finally got baptized when I was 17 years old. And now I'm here in seminary, in the candidacy process to become a Lutheran pastor. <laughs> He who has promised is faithful. I hope that me sharing my testimony today encourages you all to also share your testimonies with each other. I also hope that in apocalyptic times like the ones we are currently living in, we can understand and appreciate the value of prioritizing our faith and our relationship with God and that we can encourage one another in our faith journeys. Sharing our stories, yes, it requires vulnerability and authenticity, which can be intimidating. But if we do this, we can remind each other of God's faithfulness even now, and we can make it through the chaos together. Amen.
as we show up in the world believing in Christ, we confess our faith through the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Rooted in God's abundant love for the world, let us pray for our neighbors, the church, and all of creation. Mark us with the cross of Christ, O God. Provoke us to love one another. Instill upon us the power of testimony and help us all to share our story of faith. Merciful God, God of abundance, you have poured out a large measure of earthly blessings. Our table is richly furnished our cup overflows, and we live in safety and security. Teach us to set our hearts on you and not on material blessings. Keep us from becoming captivated by prosperity and grant us in wisdom to use your blessings to your glory and to the service of humankind. Merciful God, receive our prayer. With a selfless power, you protect all who take refuge in you. As nations rise against nations, defend all who are displaced or affected by war or violence. We name this day Palestine, Ukraine, Lebanon, Israel, and Haiti. Empower all people and nations to pursue peace. Merciful God, in your presence you give fullness of joy. Care for all for whom joy feels distant. Be present with persons experiencing depression, anxiety, addiction, or any mental illness. We pray for all who are sick. Bring them healing and wholeness. We name this day Eleanor. Charlie, Nancy, all on our prayer list, and those we name before you now. Merciful God, keep watch, dear Lord, with those who work or watch or weep, and give your angels charge over those who sleep. Tend the sick, give rest to the weary, Bless the dying, soothe the suffering, comfort the afflicted, shield the joyous. Merciful God, receive our prayer. O loving God, to turn away from you is still it, to turn away from you is to fall, to turn toward you is to rise, and to stand before you is to abide forever. Grant us, dear God, in all our duties your help in all our uncertainties, your guidance, in all our dangers, your protection, and in all our sorrows, your peace. Merciful God, receive our prayer. With thanksgiving, we remember saints and angels who delight in your everlasting presence. As their lives inspire ours, provoke us always to love, holding fast to the confession of our hope in you. We name the saints of our lives. Merciful God, receive our prayer. we offer our prayers to you, gracious God, trusting in your boundless love for all that you have made. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And with you.
we extend God's peace to one another this day. Carl Fried, God's peace be with you. God's peace be with you.
Lord Jesus, our portion and our cup, you offered yourself in love for the world, and in this meal you nourish us with your life. Fill us with your abundance, that we may feed the hungry and welcome the stranger, trusting in your name. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, Almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death in the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so, with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the host of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy are you, God of power and might. Heaven and earth are filled with your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in your name. Hosanna in the highest. You are indeed holy, almighty, and merciful God. You are most holy, and great is the majesty of your glory. You so love the world that you gave your only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. We give you thanks for his coming into the world to fulfill for us your holy will and to accomplish all things for our salvation. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks, broke it, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to his disciples, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you, for all people, for the forgiveness of God. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ, Christ has died. died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Remembering, therefore, his salutary command, his life-giving passion and death, his glorious resurrection and ascension, and the promise of his coming again. We give thanks to you, O Lord God Almighty, not as we ought, but as we are able. We ask you mercifully to accept our praise and thanksgiving, and with your word and Holy Spirit to bless us, your servants, and these, your own gifts of bread and wine, so that we and all who share in the body and blood of Christ may be filled with heavenly blessing and grace and receiving the forgiveness of sin may be formed to live as your holy people and be given our inheritance with all your saints. To you, O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be all honor and glory in your holy church, now and forever. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Behold, God is making all things new. Take your place in the new creation. Amen. There's enough body of Christ given for you. 
We do have cups. They're here, somewhere. <laughs> I do, I saw. The blood of Christ shed for you. given for you. Roberta, body of Christ, given for you. Lisa, body of Christ, given for you. Jenny, body of Christ, given for you. Roger, body of Christ, is given for you. Barbara, body of Christ, is given for you. Dan, got body of Christ, given for you. Nisha, body of Christ, given for you. Rachel, body of Christ, is given for you. Sam, body of Christ is given for you. Benta, body of Christ is given for you. Kathy, the body of Christ is given for you. Greg, the body of Christ is given for you. Peter, body of Christ is given for you. Joan, body of Christ is given for you. Ruth, the body of Christ is given for you. Rajoski, body of Christ is given for you. Ellen, body of Christ is given for you. Josephine, body of Christ is given for you. Warren, body of Christ is given for you. Kathy, the body of Christ is given for you. Kevin, body of Christ is given for you. Ginger, body of Christ is given for you. Christ is given for you. Allison, body of Christ is given for you. Christine, body of Christ is given for you. Dale, body of Christ is given for you. Sarah, body of Christ is given for you. Julia, body of Christ is given for you. Stephanie, body of Christ is given for you. Sean, body of Christ is given for you. body of Christ is given for you. Martha, body of Christ is given for you. Beth, body of Christ is given for you. Anil, body of Christ is given for you. Newman, body of Christ is given for you. Wayne, body of Christ is given for you. Sushil, body of Christ is given for you. Rich, body of Christ is given for you. Sherry, body of Christ is given for you. Martin, body of Christ is given for you. body of Christ is given for you.
the blood of Christ is shed for you. Please rise. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in God's grace. Faithful God, you have spread before us a feast of rich food and drink in the body and blood of your Son. Now send us out to labor with you in service to the world you have made and among the people you have made your home. In Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. And please be seated. Well, good morning. Good morning. And welcome to worship this morning. It is great to see you and to be together as we worship God, as we are marked with the cross of uh, Christ forever. Next Sunday, uh, besides being Christ the King Sunday, will be the Sunday that we offer our intent of giving for 20 25. Can you believe that we're saying 2025? <laughs> uh, I hope you receive the card in the mail with the stewardship letter. If not, there, is, there are extra cards on the table uh, right by the, uh, by the bulletins and the uh, communion offerings there. So just grab a, a card. Give it some thought. Uh, think about the church, the ministry that we do, and be generous as we share of the bounty that we have received. So that is next Sunday. Let me back up to today, invite you to our adult class. I'll be looking at St. Paul's Cathedral in London, and I look forward to sharing uh, a little bit of the story that uh, we experienced this past summer. Uh, pastor class will conclude this Wednesday night, and also next Sunday I'm going to back up um, for the Wham! A annual Thanksgiving service. Uh, some, some of you have shared, you know, how do we, how do we live our faith uh, in these chaotic times, as, as Kirthana shared this morning? Well, one way we, is we worship together with our neighbors, our, our neighbors of the Christian faith, the Jewish faith, and the Islamic faith. The service is 7 o'clock next Sunday night at Meadow Lakes uh, Community. Where Ellie lives. We're all, we're all coming over for, for coffee afterwards, Ellie, okay? Uh, but it's right across from Petty School in Heightstown, so pretty easy to uh, find. Um, okay, I think that's it. Pastor Dale is here to talk about the season of Advent, which is right around the corner. Yes, it is. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. My favorite season of the church year is upon us. And we heard your requests. You have often said, can we please start offering some daytime events? And so we are going to do that in the season of Advent. Uh, Wednesdays at noon, I'm offering an Advent light lunch, meaning light. We're focusing on the light of Christ as we anticipate the birth of the Christ child. Um, if you want to RSVP, that would be great. Just so I have an idea of how many people are coming, there is a sign-up sheet uh, outside of the church office. We're we're going to gather in the fellowship hall. We're keeping it simple. Just bring a sandwich to share and a salad and or a salad, whatever you'd like. Um, and don't let food keep you from coming. You, you know, if you don't feel like preparing, you know there's always plenty. So Advent light lunch is starting um, in December. Then also, um, one of the ministries we provide at the House Next Door is care to pastors. Um, I sit with a lot of pastors for spiritual direction. And they are in need of care. And so one of the things that we're going to offer for them on the first Sunday of Advent, December 1st, is dinner church. Um, 
One of the things I'm hearing from my colleagues is that everything that's offered in the Synod for them is continuing education, which is important. But one of the things they've really appreciated about the house next door, to use our uh, mission statement, it's a safe space and a place of grace for them to just gather and be. So if you can help us host that Jenner Church, I would greatly appreciate it. Again, we're keeping it simple. We're just going to have soup and bread supper. There's a sign-up sheet again outside of Sherry's office if you'd like to help with that ministry. And then um, just you can read the bulletin on your own. There's a couple other Advent offerings that we are offering uh, during this season. For those of you who are crafty and artistic and like to work with your hands, there'll be an event on December 3rd. And then there's a four-week series on Zoom called Refugee Advent. And if you will remember last, uh, was it during Lent? But it was last spring that Peter and Sarah offered a series on refugee of faith. And so we're kind of picking up on that. So if you enjoyed that conversation, that's another opportunity for you as well. So hope to see you during Advent at the house next door. Okay. And we do have Advent midweek worship. Uh, we are partnering, partnering again with St. Bart's. We will be here on December the 4th, we'll be at St. Bart's on the 11th, and then on the 18th, we will have a, a Blue Christmas, as we've had every year. Pastor Dale will lead that service the week before Christmas. So I call your attention to that, and also the Thanksgiving. First, we have to get to Thanksgiving, right? Uh, and uh, we're, we're, we're beginning to make the collections. The announcement is there all week. Long, uh, we need to have it by Thursday because the distribution at St. Bart's is Saturday. Anything else to say on that, Roberta, on, on the Thanksgiving baskets? Just a short, a brief time correction. Uh, I will be here Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday from 9.30 to 1 rather than 9 o'clock to 1. Thank you. Okay, 9.30. And you know, uh, uh, Joan uh, has an announcement about all the plastic, <laughs> plastic, plastic everywhere, but we're, 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 we're doing our, our part here. We are. So um, as of my recording last night, this is really the month of October, we collected, us and St. Bart's, 31 bags, and thank you to Joan and Peter who have delivered them all to the collection station, and it amounts to 147 pounds. <laughs> Yay! So if you do the math, we need 1,000 pounds over 12 months. We need to average 83 pounds a month. So we're already ahead. So keep it coming. We're going to bag up. We know that one is full t today, and uh, so we're going to bag up the two today. And then I'll be in touch with St. Bart's this week uh, to see what they've collected. And, uh, and we'll keep it, uh, keep it, get, keep keep it, it coming. Keep yes, it going. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you, Joan. Are there other announcements for the good of the church? Oh, uh, Dale has another. Oh, <laughs> there's a big, big limb that fell right in the center of the labyrinth. If there's any strong, strong men, <laughs> women too, I mean, excuse me. Uh, it, uh, uh, if we could just move it off, we're not gonna, just going to move it off so people can walk the labyrinth. Right now you can't walk the labyrinth because that tree is, it's, it's a pretty major. I saw it go down too, it was this windy weather. And, you know, sometimes you hear this of trees going down on people, but thankfully nobody was walking the labyrinth at that time. Okay, let us stand for the benediction today. The ancient one enthroned, the crucified one now risen, the indwelling one poured out. Bless you now and forever. Amen. Amen.
dawn draws near and the world is about to And now go in peace, encourage one another in Christ. Thank God.